I just don't sign documents to do with the media. If they want to interview me, that's fine by me. But why I start signing release documents before I start is beyond me. Okay. Others do, I know. Others yeah. do? Hmm. Okay. Nando wouldn't until, he, until yeah. after the interview. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it uh, seems to me to be um, um, a safety. I'm doing it for I, what I regard as a legitimate purpose. If it is not, and I do not be, want to be arguing over a legal document, I want to go over, argue over my legitimate, reasonable expectations. Right. This will be somewhat easier in a court of law, I think. Okay. Um, um, could, I, could you just give me a second? I just need to focus up. Okay. Yeah. I actually went to school with Brittany and Joel. They were oh, okay. the years above and below me. At? Uh, Otomoto. Otomoto. Yeah. Cool, I'm focused. All right, uh, uh, I think we're all ready to begin. Um, Sorry, I'm just gonna move a tiny bit. Uh, before we do, I just wanna let you know, this is the uh, camera, it looks small, but it's recording in high definition. This is our primary microphone, that's our backup microphone, in case we have to sync it up later, if something goes wrong with the audio, audio is more important than the video. Reflector board, we're using that as the primary light to look from the window. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we're ready to begin. Um, so keeping in mind that this film is being made primarily for an American audience, mm. not very familiar with New Zealand politics, uh, could you briefly explain what the New Zealand First Party is? The New Zealand First Party was started in uh, 1993. Uh, it goes into its 15th year next July. Um, it's a party that was formed out of the uh, old uh, Labour and National Party in terms of its uh, collective membership. Uh, it's a party in the centre. That, um, has, that believes that we have too often had extremists uh, of the left and the right uh, running New Zealand politics and running our country, and that we would seek to uh, have enough influence to rein in the extremists on either side and uh, have some uh, moderation and balance and common sense in uh, the political um, structure, policies, and uh, forward vision of New Zealand. Uh, so. Uh, could you name specific policies that uh, aren't brought forward by the two um, major parties? That well, both the major parties were involved in a wholesale uh, asset sell-off uh, into foreign interests uh, between um, 84 and 1996. That stopped. But in that time, uh, literally billions and billions of dollars of asset value were sold at fire, sa fire sale rates, often on the deception that they would go to paying off debt when they didn't. They went to pay the ongoing running of the government costs. And uh, we turn around today and we see that once what once was a share market structure, for example, with 19% foreign ownership, is now at about 70 to 74%, somewhere in that variable. It, that's a huge change in just over 20 years. Um, how does that uh, differ from the United First, which is also a centre party, as they described it? Well. Um, Centre Party for uh, New Zealand First is home. For the other parties, whenever it's convenient, it's a foreign country. Okay. And um, you, uh, ha how long have you been in politics? Since 1978. Okay. Uh, could you tell us uh, about uh, how elections have changed from, well, that's maybe a bit broad, maybe we can narrow that down. What was it like in your first election? Well, the uh, first election was a straight two-party fight. And uh, that's the way it has been for uh, really something like 50, 60 years. Uh, now it is uh, a different uh, circumstance with far more uh, competitors involved in the political environment and more parties in parliament, very much like the German system or the system you'll see throughout uh, all of uh, Western Europe and now Eastern Europe. So uh, in the old days it was a straight fight. They were wrong, we were right. Um, the sad thing about that is the truth often lies in between. The truth is often because of circumstances, facts and personalities and the record of people in the past agree a thing. But that doesn't mean that you're uh, diminishing the truth, but it means that you don't allow for a statement to be made which when you study who is making it, uh, there's a certain outrageous absurdity about it. Like, for example, the National Party argued today that they would govern in the interests of New Zealanders. Or the Labour Party 
having to, for example, admit that they had a terrible uh, patch of, uh, of um, experimentation where they picked up the economic policies of the radical right at a level not seen anywhere, anywhere in the world ever. And as a consequence, the uh, Labour Party has changed dramatically in 2007 from the party it was in 1984. Um, in 1979, that was uh, a strange uh, election because... Uh, 78. 78, mm. sorry, um, got my year wrong. In 1978, strange election results, right? Mm. Uh, uh, Labour got more votes, National got more seats. Well, that's the shape of first past the post, is in that you have to... Um, if you want to win in the first past the post, you've got to assemble your majority in the right constituencies. And it's quite possible, as it was back then, for a party to get 21% of the vote and have no members of parliament. You're talking about social credit? That's right. Okay. Uh, <coughs> what were your impressions of the social credit party? You... Um, the social credit party uh, obviously served a uh, need at the time to express disquiet with the old parties. The problem was that they had an impossible task of trying to explain their economic policy. Now, it wasn't that the economic policy was totally incapable of explanation, it's just that the formula they used seemed to be the answer for every problem, whether it be social or economic. Now, frankly, as we know in life, circumstances change. The road changes, you must drive differently depending on conditions. But they always had the one formula, regardless of conditions, regardless of circumstances. And over time, it, uh, they were subject to uh, intellectual atrophy. So, um, how would you compare uh, skepticism in the political process uh, from the 1978 election uh, throughout uh, the era of Rajanomics and Rupanasia and uh, up until uh, MMP? Well, the, the uh, skepticism, the disbelief, and the uh, astonishment at what was happening ended up in a dramatic change to New Zealand's electoral system. We went from first past the post. Winner takes all, regardless of whether you only got 30% of the vote uh, in any constituency, to uh, having to get a uh, majority in Parliament, be it constructed by more than one party. So a party with less votes uh, on election day could not and cannot govern in New Zealand today. Okay. And um, do you, what about after MFA? Do you think there's less popular skepticism in politics? Um, the best barometer measure for that is the number of people who still take part in our electoral system. It is extraordinarily high against other countries at this point in time. That's my evidence that people are still uh, for the current electoral structure. I believe if we'd have stayed with first past the post and there had been no changes in 1993 and preparation for 1996, there would be a significant diminution in the number of people who turn out to vote. Now there are some countries where the um, leader is, for example, chosen by less than 30% of the eligible adult potential voters. That is, they don't even enroll. They don't even vote on election day. Now, we haven't got anything like that. Our system is still very, very credible in terms of the levels of participation. Now, the others can argue what they like, but they can't argue that that's not a fact. Well, you were one of the earlier supporters of MFT, right? I'm not just the earliest supporter, I'm the principal supporter of it. I campaigned extraordinarily hard to see the end of First Past the Post because uh, the um, then the government, uh, the National, had come in in 1990 promising to stop the uh, so-called uh, experiment of the Labour Party 84 to 1990. They did not. They headed down the, the road at twice the speed and a massive majority of 1990 ended up in a hung parliament within three years. But during that time, there had been two referenda and people had voted for a change. They were never going to put up with that again. That is, a party coming to parliament with a manifesto, one for the public, uh, public's consumption, and the other one secretly in their back pocket to be pulled out the day after the election uh, for their elitist backers' consumption. And MMP has mostly put a stop to that, you think? It seriously put a stop to it because you cannot control four, five parties. You might be able to control one, which they did terribly successfully, but you can't control, uh, and, and maybe two, but you can't control five, six parties. 
What about the criticism that when you uh, have to form a coalition, you can't adhere to your manifesto because you have to make compromises? Everyone that comes into politics comes in knowing that you will not get 100% of what you want, but 80% is sure beats getting nothing. And likewise, in uh, a post-election negotiating process, you have to compromise, uh, and, um, but you hope to get as much of your manifesto as possible. And when it, it is all added up, if you've got a strong record of achievement, uh, then that is something to be satisfied with, rather than to be there with no input or change to the social and economic structure of a country, though you might have been in Parliament for huh, a lifetime. Um, how, how much influence do, uh, do minor parties have in the MNP system? Um, the appropriate level of influence. You have to bear that in mind when you're negotiating. Don't overplay your hand, but whatever you do, don't underplay it. Um, the media has often referred to you as a kingmaker. Do you think that's a fair, uh, a fair a comparison, especially with the 2005 and 1996 election? Uh, not really. In 999, we missed by one seat having that um, potential influence, and one seat in 2002. Um, but I don't see it as a kingmaker in that sense. Uh, your responsibility is to form a government, and a government provides uh, stability and order, and you know a thousand other things that are important to, to, to life. Uh, the trouble with the New Zealand media, uh, and it's really uh, terrible criticism of them, is that they are they are, they are financial owners who have starved them of the resources for investigative journalism and, and professional reporting um, think that the whole thing is an event and it's a, a, a fight between the two old parties. And so they constantly talk about Labour won or Nationals going to win or Nationals going to lose or what have you, where in fact that has never been the situation even before MMP occurred in 1996. By 1993, Jim Bolger was looking around for other parties to try and form a government. So, um, but my real point is this. My real point is this. Uh, look at societies where there is no form uh, of stable government, where it happens, uh, changes happen at the whim of parliamentarians who cannot be trusted for five minutes to shake hands with another party and keep their word. Uh, Think of all those countries, and I can name you a stack, a whole list of countries where there's awful instability. Well, our advantage is that our system is stable, and contrary to the wish of those who are uh, temporarily the losers in any, any election, the system does not collapse, the governments don't collapse, they go for the full term, and uh, as a consequence, people who are trying to order their economic and social uh, lives have the freedom, the tranquility, the peace, and above all, the stability to do so. That's fundamentally important. The, uh, that was actually uh, interesting. Uh, now, that hasn't, it's a, it's a criticism that hasn't poured out, but there was a criticism made by the Campaign for Better Government that it would, MMP would reduce stability. Um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the Campaign for Better Government? Well, the English have a saying um, when they talk about a stuffed shirt affair. It means that you look huge, you look massive, but in fact, is a skeleton of nothingness. The campaign for open government or better government, uh, formed by uh, the head of telecoms, then a foreign-owned company, I might add, had the effrontery to seek to intervene in New Zealand's politi politics to run a campaign to determine the very structure of our electoral system from abroad. Now, that outrage would, appear, would, would uh, be obvious to most countries and bubble to most countries' media. But because it suited the uh, financial owners of a very loose um, media structure of this country, they never raised a syllable or a sound about it. And on election night, 993, when they had lost, we found out what the campaign for better government was about. It was about a man, his family, and his daughter, and nothing behind it. Now, the sham of that will be obvious to anyone who can, is concerned uh, on, for the question of um, sovereignty and self-determination. This foreign-owned company sought to change that. But what do you think they did? Well, I don't think they did it. Yeah. Because they were awfully arrogant, they had all the money, 
and they were also involved in a massive monopoly of telecommunications in this country, which uh, when uh, the uh, telecoms was privatized in July of 1990, they then enjoyed 17 long years of monopoly, price gouging business and consumers, and sadly, backed by the two old parties. That's all changing because of pressure in 2007, but that's how long their monopoly continued, and that's why they did it. It was good for their business, adverse for everyone else's business in New Zealand. Um, so could you, uh, you started your, uh, I, I, I probably know the answer to this already, <laughs> but you started your, uh, your political career in national. That's right. Um, why did you uh, break off from National to form New Zealand First in 1993, I believe? Yeah, 1993. Uh, for the same reason that Winston Churchill made a change to his uh, political party. He said that some people change their principles to suit their party. I changed my party to suit my principles. And I left the National Party, as did Doug Wollaton, the president of my party, and many others, and many left Labour as well, to form a new party because they had deserted what the parties they originally uh, uh, were members of ever stood for. Uh, and uh, the record of asset sales and the record of toadying, toadying to uh, uh, the idea of globalism, which they somehow think means all investment is good. Now, most smart economies have a huge encouragement for foreign investment when it fits their economic plan. The creation of employment and wealth and exports is what their foreign investment policies are about. In New Zealand, National Labour ran the argument that all foreign money, even if it be a takeover and a destruction of business and an asset sale-off, sell -off, was somehow good. It's the most lazy economic argument, it is the most absurd uh, intellectual argument, but it is also a form of treachery against the common and ordinary people of this country, who had for generations built those assets up. Good example is New Zealand Railways, bought by foreign interests, with some assistance by some of the New Zealand businesses, uh, totally um, recapitalised, then sold off, and run into the ground to the extent the government had to buy it back. Again, um, Air New Zealand, a very respectable, internationally well-known airline, was bought by foreign interests, run into the ground, the ground, and the government had to buy it back. So, you know, I've got many other examples of that. Yeah. Um, well, I'll give you one example. Now, look, you must know this that when we decided to privatise the airwaves of this country, we ran a vicary sale. That is, you bid a million dollars, uh, you bid $10,000 and I bid one dollar. You win the bid at, uh, because you put up the highest bid, a million dollars, but you only have to pay the second bidder's price. Does that sound absurd to you? A little, yeah. Well, that's what Labour and National did and their record of, of economic absurdity is the reason why you have parties like New Zealand First whose job it is to keep them and the system honest. So New Zealand, uh, since you've, uh, since MMP has been around and New Zealand First has had more influence as a minor party, uh, what, have you, what have you been able to accomplish in the MMP system despite never having a, uh, a plurality of seats? In of asset sales uh, that have not been in the public's interest. Uh, a substantial investment in education and health, which is a critical part of this country's record and uh, this country's investment in human capital. Um, thousands of, of, of extra police, uh, an export year drive, hopefully one day a change the Reserve Bank Act so that our currency reflects the fact that we're an export dependent nation. Um, we've turned the racing industry upside down in the context of taking it as a massive failing industry to a roaring success it is today in 2007. All done in less than two years, I might add. Um, we've turned around payments to the elderly of this country, put hundreds of millions of dollars extra into aged care. Uh, we have a super, um, super gold card, which the elderly are picking up today, which gives them discount purchasing and makes their money go a lot further. And above all, we're the ones who have saved the uh, level of um, super payments for the elderly who make up 540,000 people in this country. Now, I know we're only a small economy, but um, the, 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 the list of things we've been able to do as a, a new party, in my view, is very credible of its founders and of the people who um, support New Zealand First. Uh, so, 
uh, going back a little bit to MMP, um, uh, the first election in 1996, uh, the first uh, negotiation, uh, I believe, took, was, uh, was it six months? No, no. No, six weeks. Six weeks. Six weeks. Um, why did they take so long? Well, it's not long. Why? What, what, why has it been? Why was well, it? No, well, that, that, no, see, um, that, that is also a conspiracy of the newspapers and of the uh, opponents of, uh, of MMP. You know full well that in Holland it takes three to six months. It takes months in other parts of Western Europe. So why would six weeks be, in its first time, in its first outing, be a long time? Well, now, that's number one. Uh, number two, I see a presidential campaign being run in the United States at the moment in terms of sorting out who, are the, who the candidates are going, to be, are going to be. They have been campaigning for two and a half, three, maybe four years. Some of them have been getting ready for ten years, as you well know. Is that long? No, it's not. Not if we get the right outcome. Um, so in, uh, what happened when uh, Jenny Shipley took over the National Party in, uh, in, during the 1990s? She was chosen to destruct the coalition. That uh, cannot be denied. She had uh, a, a, a clique in the National Party who had decided that although they had negotiated this deal on which we would govern for the next three years, they would try and renegotiate it during the, the, the term. Uh, there were no circumstances to justify that. My evidence for that is the fact that after the Asian currency crisis, where we lost some, sometimes 60% of our market. We nevertheless got inflation down, interest rates down, public expenditure up, exports up, and uh, had a surplus at the end of the 98 budget. So what was, her, what was the reason for their alarm? It was simply that a group of financial backers of the National Party had been reined in. Asset sales were over, and they wanted to free themselves from that constraint. The moment the, moment the coalition fell, Within six weeks, they had sold Contact Energy, a major energy company in New Zealand. And we're heading down the track for other sales, except they got tipped over in the, in the next election. That, that is uh, a, another thing. Um, a number of people, when that coalition broke down, a number of people left New Zealand first, joined National. Mm. Uh, what happened to them politically? Well, the corrupt, corruption and bribery will always have that effect. If you say to someone, if you leave that party, We'll keep you on as a minister, with all the uh, trappings and uh, and all the income and what have you. That'll always have an effect, uh, but there's only one word for that, uh, and that is the, um, um, my view, the corrupt destruction of uh, a person's prior commitment to a party, a cause, and a policy. So one day they were ministers doing this, the next day they're ministers doing that, uh, and trying to justify their existence. Are, are any of them still in parla Parliament today? One got back eventually uh, under the National Party uh, two elections later. But uh, eventually they all at some point lost their... They all lost, yes. Um, what do you think is uh, going to happen to bring that back to today to uh, the current controversy in the United Future with Gordon Copeland? Well, Copeland is finished. Uh, the United Party, I believe, will still survive. And... Um, uh, I mean, that, the, 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 treachery, the treachery of coming into Parliament under the flag of one party, believing that you will use it as a, a vehicle for uh, jumping ship to a new party, uh, is, in my view, um, a sad development in politics. Uh, it happens far too frequently in what you might call poor performing democracies, but it should not happen in a high performing democracy of the type which we are, that's had an unbroken line of free elections every three years, uh, for the last 160 years. Only nine countries in the world can make that claim, and that's why what we do is pretty critically important here. Okay. Um, back in 1992, when you first heard the results of the non-binding referendum, mm -hmm. what, what was your reaction? I was delighted because MMP had beaten off the rest. The rest have serious defects to them. Uh, as you will see if you ask any of the uh, political parties in those countries where they have the alternative systems, MMP won four to one, and I believed, even though it did not have the money and the support of big business uh, in terms of elite business, uh, that it would beat first past the post hands down, and it did. Uh, where were you when you uh, heard about the results? 
on in uh, no, September ninety two. September yeah. I was with my electorate in Tauranga. Uh, with friends or family or anything? Well, it was a Saturday night, and um, I think I'd probably been with. Uh, I can't remember exactly that because uh, <laughs> I believe it was going to win hands down anyway, and I'd campaign hard for it. Um, do you think the MMP has made politicians more accountable? Undoubtedly. Uh, and um, how has campaigning changed under MMP compared to first past the post? Well, there are many more participants uh, in the um, political scene, but. Sadly, and this is a fact, um, if you have a circumstance where there's no more real journalism or reporting, and I say that because they are not given the financial uh, room, space and time to operate in that way, then what do you have in politics? It's just events management. Now I seriously hope that we have turned that around for the 2008 election. I watched the campaigning in America for the runoffs for the uh, Democratic and Republican primaries at the moment. That's real campaigning, hard campaigning every day out in front of the public. And we should have that restored in New Zealand. Uh, it'll only happen when the media stop their indulgent, lazy, slothful attitude and think that a photo opportunity represents a political meeting. It doesn't. Well, that criticism could be made of American journalists as well. Well, they would not make it successfully uh, because I've actually been on the ground and seen the level of campaigning. And given the size of the country, it is an exhausting campaign before you even get the candidate for either party. Um, so, back in 1996, uh, and this is a, a bit of a hard question. I, you know, I'm just letting you know, uh, I'm not out to get you or anything, <laughs> but I have to ask the hard questions, and we're starting to get into them. Uh, back in 1996, do you think that um, that because you had uh, criticized the National Party and Labor, but because you had criticized the National Party, that people were surprised when you eventually entered into a coalition with them? That's a figment of the media's imagination. Uh, they know well that every editorial writer had said or criticized New Zealand First and its leader for failing to take any side right to election night. They can't have it both ways. I can show you all the editorial writers, all the criticism, about us failing to declare or refusing to declare. But our position always was, let the people speak first, let us find out who's in Parliament and in what numbers, and then we'll know who we're talking to. Uh, and unless you're a soothsayer, that's the only, and you know the election had results before they come out. What other possible intellectually sound stance can one take? Okay. Um, who, who are your uh, key supporters in the, in the public? Who, who New Zealand First is key supporters? That's very difficult to say under MMP because you're looking right across the country from the top to the bottom and you're looking for every supporter you can get. And it's hard to identify them in that context. Now clearly with other parties it is easy to, to, to identify. But for a middle of the road party uh, with um, a philosophy that uh, uh, you know the people's voice does matter uh, and that money should not be able to buy elections uh, you should not rule out anyone possibly giving you their second vote. Okay. Um, let's see. You've been both a list uh, MP and mm -hmm. an electorate MP. Uh, is there any pragmatic difference between the two? Mm, not in my party here, uh, there's not. We don't have an A and B team in New Zealand first. You're in here, you've got the same rights as everybody else, whether you're a list or a direct constituency MP. Uh, but um, in other parties, you would say that's true? Um, I can't speak for them. Um, do you think uh, cabinet is more fragmented under MMP? Because you can have uh, ministers of different parties? Well, no, it's not. I can show you cabinets where there were huge divisions. Uh, I was a member of one uh, where the friction was apparent from day one where some of the policies being pursued, some members of cabinet thought was sheer lunacy and politically suicidal. Okay. Now, I've not been in any arrangement since then, anything like that. And, um, let's see, um, in 2005, uh, one of your famous campaign promises was to go first to the party that got the most votes 
uh, when going into negotiation. Mm. What were the tactical effects of that? Well, you start with a party with the most votes, which would seem to have a better chance of forming a government. Uh, tactically, that's wise because um, number one, they would be perceived as having greater legitimacy to form a government. Um, and as it turned out, that was a smart thing to do as well. Um, the structure that the uh, other party was putting up was incapable of surviving without blowing apart within, I thought, a matter of months, which I thought was part of the design. Blame the party uh, uh, combinations blowing apart, go to an early election, having all the money in the world saved up, and they did, and uh, campaign on the basis we need all the votes, or a majority of all the votes, to govern. Uh, that, that, but do you think the effect, uh, the practical effect, was that people in the 2005 elections uh, who uh, wanted uh, a, um, a left government or a right government kind of felt that they had to vote for the major parties instead of maybe the minor parties, uh, such as uh, Progressive Greens or ACT, mm -hmm. uh, that probably would have been better fits for them? Well, that's the tragedy because uh, people are told that, excepting since 1990, those who have voted for National are going to next year with nine years of no results, returns or benefit for all their effort whatsoever. That's the mistake of that approach. I've always said to them, buy yourself some insurance. Give us a second vote. At least you'll have some conduit uh, into changing uh, politics post-election, should your party be on the outside. Uh, strategically, is the, is it the second vote, uh, the electoral vote, more important for New Zealand First than the party vote? Well, we were a first-past-the-post party ori originally, but under MMP, the second vote is the most important vote, yes. You mean the party vote? Or the, uh, the party vote, yes, party vote, because yeah. that's the vote that determines the proportion of MPs you will get in Parliament. 20% of the party vote gets you 20% of Parliament. Pretty clean and pretty fair, and around the world, it's perceived to be the fairest system there is. Yeah. Uh, do you think when people vote their party vote, are they voting more for the policies of the party or the people and personalities of the party? <laughs> I have no idea, because sometimes in the, in, the, in the party, that is the party constituency vote, the, re that's the direct vote you're talking about, the first vote, uh, you could put up a driver's dog in that win, and right. frequently have. Well, the uh, uh, right because of, because of the existence of safe seats. Oh well, no, no, it's the loyalty factor. Oh, the loyalty factor. Here's our candidate. He's blue. We're blue. Here's our candidate. She's red. I'm. We're red, but not too much intellectual decision making going on behind that. It's the party loyalty factor. Okay. Um. So. So uh, back to um, uh, back to MMP. Do you think MMP would work if it was tried in America? Oh, undoubtedly. Do you think it? Well, let me, let me ask you this question: How long do you think South Africa would keep together if they had first past the post? How long do you think Namibia would stay together if they had first past the post? How long do you think any country in Eastern Europe would stay together if they had first past the post? What MMP does is give other groups of sufficient number a stake in democracy. It gives them a voice in Parliament, and that means you get greater um, stability and uh, support for the institutions of a society throughout society. But I can look at many countries, and what I'd, I'd say to you this, if you took the American system or the UK system and tried to impose that in all the new emerging democracies of Eastern Europe, they'd explode apart tomorrow. MMP is a far fairer system. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, hold on, are we, do we have any technical problems with the tape or anything like that? Okay. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, how do you think uh, MMP has affected the lives of New Zealanders who don't typically follow politics or current events in their day to day lives? It has this effect that a few of them have had their votes wasted. Less than 10% have their votes wasted in New Zealand. On MMP, up to 60% have had their votes wasted. 
That is, they voted, 60% ended up not getting any say in who would be the government. That's not the that way it happens now. Well, it does seem very democratic with 60%. That's more than half. Oh, yes. You know, it doesn't well, par But parties have become government in this country with less than 40% of the vote under first past the post. Um, I, I mean, I've got to tell, tell you that the, the, the support for the line of questioning, which I'm sure is not your line of questioning, but which is behind the argument behind the questioning, is flogging a dead horse. I say again, where in the world would you, in the modern settings, where you've got disparate few, uh, groups and sometimes five or different, ra uh, different races or ethnic groups and perhaps three different religions, would you try first past the post? Uh, that's my challenge to all these uh, people who would have changed uh, our system back to what it was. And look at South Africa, a new and emerging democracy that has stayed together since uh, 1990. How long would it have gone if, if one race had all the members of parliament and all the say? Well, the answer to that is it would have blown apart a long time ago. So the system I'm advocating has got a respectable pedig pedigree. It, after, after all, comes from Germany. The Germans did learn after the disasters of the uh, 20s and the 40s uh, that maybe they needed a system better conducive to the stable running of their society. Do you, uh, you mentioned that, uh, do you think it, 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 it's very rare for a, a country to change its electoral system in peacetime? Yeah. And while the 1980s and 1990s mm. maybe had a lot of rapid changes, they weren't mm. on the scale of, say, the Second World War or the post-war mm. uh, depression mm. in Europe. Yes. Uh, do you think that, that uh, what are your opinions on the fact that New Zealand made this change through a referendum during mm. peacetime? Well, um, what you had was two parties that totally deserted their uh, history, uh, their um, raison d'etre for existence, uh, which had uh, secret agendas, the result usually of conspiracies with uh, outside people, um, and a, a small clique at that, I might add. Uh, they so destructed public's con the public's confidence that the public went for a change which was being offered by those of us who were campaigning for a change. The public said, yes, we believe that there's time for a change in New Zealand. Not in wartime because in wartime you'd be looking externally at the problem. This was one in peacetime where the problem was internal and patently of obvious to see. Do you think that when people voted were for MMP, were they voting more for just any sort of change, sort of to punish both the National and Labour parties for betraying them? Or was it more a, a rational uh, MMP is the better system and that's why I'm voting it for it? Well, of course it was the second. It was rational. Why do I say that? Well, in an attempt to ensure that they might be able to win if they lost the first round, they decided to have two referenda, right? One in 992 and one election day in 993. That wasn't designed to expand the democracy or people's choice. It was designed to give them a second chop at trying to beat it. And they, they lost both rounds. So when they put up that lame argument that maybe the people were not thinking rationally or reasonable, it bespeaks their arrogance and, uh, and the way they're, um, they've intellectually importuned against New Zealanders, and still miserably so. I trust the people in this matter. They had two referenda. They voted both times for change. We spoke to Nikki Hagar, who, uh, an investigative journalist in New Zealand, and he mentioned that uh, right around the time that of the 1992-1993 referendum, there were wall-to-wall -wall television ads supporting First Past the Post, do you think that was counterproductive for the people who were supporting First Past the Post? Well, they probably booted their support up 10 to 15 percent, but they were always going to lose because the New Zealanders looked at the advertisements and remembered what had happened, which was happening right in front of them at the time, actually. <laughs> so they had very visible uh, comparative evidence against this, this blandishments being put up uh, by the uh, campaign for better government, which I might add, never at any time then or since, has offered one suggestion for better government. As the English say, it was a total stuffed shirt affair. 
The um, uh, did you uh, work with the Electoral Reform Coalition at uh, during 1992-1993? Our paths crossed frequent often time, but I campaigned to kick the legs out from first past the post to see this rotten table fall, and it did. Um, um, <clears throat> Let me just uh, go over and make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, oh, okay. Uh, here's a question that uh, I'm sure you're going to dodge. Um, who, uh, who would you prefer to support in 2008? Uh, which party would you prefer to go enter into coalition with? Well, let me ask you this question. We are 11 months away from an election, possibly 11 months away. We've yet to see the policies or the uh, personality promotion that goes with these policies for those next 11, next 11 months. Only a fool tests the water with both feet. I'd rather see what's on offer before I and my colleagues and our thousands of people out there working for New Zealand First made a decision. That's the only honest intellectual thing you can do. Everything else is bias and prejudice without any regard to reason. And by the way, when I said dodge before, I mean, I don't mind. No, no, I don't mind. I don't mind. I don't mind. As long as you, I, I don't mind. Anyway, that you ask the question. I've been in the game a long time. <coughs> I'm not offended. Make no bones about it. Okay. Um, no, I, it, it just. But you uh, do get my point, don't yeah. you? Yeah. Why well, would you make up your mind yeah. uh, for the sea conditions? Because it's, yeah. Until it's you know what the weather looks like. Um, so, Helen, did you have any questions uh, that uh, you could think of? Um, just a couple of quick ones. What, oh, I'll get you to direct them to Brian just for the camera's sake. What did you think of the electoral finance bill? Well, it's still to go through and be, to be complete, uh, but uh, the electoral finance bill will enable there to be elections in New Zealand that are free, fair, open, uh, and not uh, unduly influenced uh, by um, what you might call uh, huge financial interests, whether they be from the left or the right. People forget the unions have had a bit able to amass, amass millions of dollars in the past on the left and big business on the right. But no election should be decided by the level of financial uh, uh, subscription. It should be decided on the issues and on the, <laughs> the truth of policies and on campaigns which happen, uh, not just uh, sort of what, what you might call a series of photo opportunities structured merely uh, to show that someone in a good light. That, that's actually kind of interesting because um, it, it seems to be uh, the right, not just national who you would ex you would expect to oppose this because it, anything they can do to make labor look bad makes them look better in comparison for the next election. But there is a person who was part of that, uh, the Young Nationals uh, named David Farrar. Bill English, he's a blogger, Kiwi blog, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you mm. probably are. Mm. Bill English actually credited him with leading the fight against the electoral uh, finance bill. Uh, what do you think the impact of new media is? <laughs> well, how sad is that? <laughs> <laughs> if you knew what you were talking about, you used to work for the National Party as well, don't forget. Yeah. How sad is that? Um, you know, it's one thing to fight uh, with uh, uh, a fiction, and the fiction is this. Was anyone stopped in the streets marching against this bill? Was any journalist interviewed by the police on this bill? Was anyone stopped from doing anything about this on this bill? No. So what you've got is, you know, me, think, me thinks they do protest too much. And really, they've run out of steam. What do you think about new media in, in general? On, uh, because there are a number of bloggers on all sides of the yes. political spectrum. Well, apart from the, the absurdity of allowing uh, people to defame anyone and everyone with new technology, and that's irresponsible in a, in a degree. Uh, and I think that'll be sorted out in time by responsible uh, elements in society, including people who have better amassed them enough money up to sue some of these uh, wanton uh, specialists in defamation. Uh, it is an essential component of the debate. It's, the new, it's, it's, it's a new um, um, element which you've got to have regard to. Um, but uh, in the end, they won't win campaigns. They're an essential part of campaigning, though, I think, in, in the modern world. Okay. Uh, Helen, did you have anything else? I actually don't. It's on a slightly separate topic. Um, I wondered what, if you had much to do with the McGillicuddy Series Party when they were in Parliament. They were never in Parliament. Oh, sorry, sorry, when they were campaigning. No. Mm -hmm. I did my best to avoid them. 
I'll tell you why. Uh, politics is a very serious business. It affects the economic and social outcomes for people. And if you think that the, the first principle and the first objective of politics is to increase and to improve people's happiness, why would you spend any time with people who think it's a bit of a joke? <laughs> that, that, it, that does bring up an interesting point. They died out around the same time, and a lot of people, some people have said that since MNP gave people, gave everybody a say, yes. that pe fewer people regarded politics as a joke. If you lived in a safe seat, you might as well have wasted your vote, so that was some of McGillicuddy Sirius' support. Yeah, but, but McGillicuddy Sirius was never anything but a few people running around in Scott's kilt looking absurd. You know, I mean, why, why are we even talking about these people? It's like talking about a group in the United States living way up in the, in the, in the, in the Appalachians who comprise 100 people and saying, well, they were a serious voice in American politics. Now, come on. Um, and I, I do want to ask you about this because it does seem to be something that we haven't touched on. Uh, when doing research for this uh, documentary, uh, one of your most famous speeches was in 2005. It was the, the Queen Street speech. Um, where, uh, and that's uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask about is um, a little bit about New Zealand versus immigration policy. Our immigration policy is the same policy as every political party in the whole of Asia. Every political party regardless of their political colours or their shape or where they sit on the political divide in Malaysia, Indonesia, um, um, Japan, uh, Singapore, have the identical policy of New Zealand First. That is, immigration should be based around your economic, your export, your educational and scientific needs, and maybe specialists when it comes to medicine and other things. Uh, but they should, the whole immigration debate uh, and policy should be structured around a country's needs. In short, people we need, not who need us. And that's pretty fundamental common sense, excepting you've got uh, some uh, people who think that to, uh, to um, demand the right to have a say as to who comes into your country and decide who will be a New Zealand citizen is somehow being racist. Well, excuse me, I've been here, my family's heritage goes back in this country a thousand years. I think we're entitled to know who's going to come and live in this country and whether they're going to sign up to be New Zealand citizens or whether they intend to come here, just use this as a vault hole or a deposit for a new culture without any regard to our laws, our values or anything. Now, around the world today, there are many, many countries who have come around to that point of view. We are the majority on this matter, not the, uh, the few who somehow think, well, I got here, therefore I can bring in Uncle Tom Cobley and all. So what are uh, New Zealand's immigration needs in 2007? The same that they've always been for 100 years, but they change with the shape of your economy. If you've got a vacuum or an absence of people in critical parts of your economy, then that's an explanation to get them in from overseas. But to have some sort of idea that if we bring in this number, it will prop up the uh, demand structure of an economy and, and, and consumerism, and we'll keep our economy going by those means, is a long-term plan for uh, economic and social destruction. I know of no country in the world that has voluntarily, and I emphasize voluntarily, followed New Zealand's current policy. Uh, anything else? And by current, I mean the last 20 years. Any, anything else, Helen? Um, I, I, this is something that I wouldn't want to use in our documentary mm. because I don't think it's pertinent. Mm. Um, but I guess I just put to you as a politician that represents my country. Mm. Um, a lot of people would come at the immigration issue from an ethical perspective and say mm. we've got an obligation to help out people that are significantly worse off than us from a utilitarian perspective. What's your response to that? Well, go to your bank account, take out your money and send it to those people announced and, and invested in their country invested in their living structure, their housing structures, their medical structures. You can do all that at a far more reduced cost in those countries. But whilst you do it, make sure their leaders respect fundamental human rights and developmental structures and, and uh, optimum um, economic programs. If they don't, then there'll be no change.
But if, but if people argue. feel that way, then well, like, why don't they do that? Go and invest in Bangladesh go and, and put money into, uh, into parts of Africa. Because the other alternative is, and it really was put out, set out by a former president in, the, uh, in, of the, uh, in, in China, when you recall Jimmy Carter was demanding that he let the Chinese people go. And he said to Jimmy Carter, well, how many do you want? 10 million, 30 million, 100 million. That's what it comes down to. I guess one argument against investment in other countries is the level of corruption, um, which you alluded to. Mm. Um, I mean, that, that sort of makes it a less appealing option, I suppose. No, uh, look, uh, I'm the Minister for Overseas to Belvanade. We've had our biggest increase ever, and we'll have bigger increases as the years go by if, um, if I'm lucky enough to stay in this job. Why have we done that? Because I think that, particularly the Pacific, is my background. It's uh, the country's background, it's our neighbourhood, it's a huge area. But we need to invest in our neighbourhood and we'll get a far greater return for our money than somehow think if we relocate them here to jobs that don't exist, somehow because they become part of the demand structure, we will uplift New Zealand's economy. There's no evidence of that working because most of our growth, and most of our growth has been consumptive. Whereas most people, many would argue that to have sound e and a sound economy, you're Growth needs to be productive, export-based. And that's my beef with this government and the former one. Bringing it back to electoral reform, which is a much more boring topic. Um, not for me, it's not. I thought it was the most exciting campaign. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to basically, for Americans, there's a reason why we're doing this as an independent uh, documentary. Uh, um, but back, is there anything that you would change to New Zealand's electoral system uh, today to improve it? Um, the answer is probably accepting you should give a system a time before you evaluate its soundness or not. You, you recall New Zealand's system for 38 years when it first started was pretty chaotic and then it stabilized itself in about 1893, which is a long, long time ago, and they had the somewhat same system all the way to 996. This is a new system here uh, and people are getting used to it and how it works and how they can help it work better and obviously there will be changes in the future but let's see that we know what it all means and how it's bedded down before we rush in to interfere with it. And that's what I'd advocate because uh, um, you know four elections is not a lot of chance to experiment. They had a century with their one Let's uh, give us a bit longer, but I think that the system will stabilise itself. There will be fewer parties in Parliament, and um, that is probably to the good. Um, what do you think of the 5% threshold? Well, it's an extraordinarily high threshold. It's as high as it is anywhere in the world. It's tough to get 5% right across the nation. Anyone can get 5% in this city or 5% in that part of the country, but to get it 5% across the nation is tough. And do you think the 5% threshold is too high, too low, just right? It's possibly too high, but I'll go for 5% as a compromise for the anti-MMP people, because if they don't know that's a high threshold, then they don't know anything about the international circumstance where, some, where in some countries it's 1%, but it's 5% here, and that's why we've got fewer parties. And, um, uh, you know, there, there are most, most argue that it's too high, but I'm happy with the 5%. It'd be, it's tough, you've got a, a lot to shoot for, and um, you live or die by your success on that store. What about uh, the, the four year, uh, sorry, the three year term between elections? Uh, we talked to a number of people who say that's just too short because you're spending uh, the first year you know, recovering from the election, one year doing actual work, one year gearing up for the next election. I agree. I agree. I, I, there's no chance of changing that by way of a referendum because there are too many timid souls in the left or the right who fear the other side might win and get four years. I think the only way it can be done now, uh, because under MMP you can have four years. I think under first past the post you could not have uh, four years because there was so little restraint and, 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 and fetter uh, for what you might call dramatic uh, 
we, you know, we weren't regarded as the fastest lawmakers in the West. Now, that doesn't happen under, under MMP. But my point is, I think that the parties in opposition, and I say it for my own party as well, should be prepared to join together and promise to, and offer the governing parties this outcome. Whoever wins the next election gets to govern for four years. I think that's democratic, it's fair, it's not biased for anyone's favour, but they should do it two years out from an election so everyone can know what the outcome will be uh, and so that you, you know, you're, you're, you're not unfairly making the offer knowing that it favours just one side. But I know that if it went to a referendum, I, I believe this, all the timid souls who back one side think, what if the other side won? They'll get four years. And that's the way those past referendum have uh, resulted in, in a three-year term. It was too short. It's just too hard. And you're campaigning all the time. It's high cost. And it is debilitating in terms of the work you'd like to do on the governance of the country economically and socially. You mentioned uh, that New Zealand was regarded as the fastest lawmakers in the West. We were. We were. Um, so Jeffrey Palmer came out with a book called Unbridled Power. Could you explain a little bit about uh, uh, about the unbridled power under New Zealand and first past the post? Well, he was partly right uh, with respect to his book, but then of course he got in in 1980. Uh, he wrote Unbridled Power in the late 70s, but he got into the government as the deputy prime minister in 1984 and he proved that he'd learnt and his colleagues had learnt nothing. They were legislating faster and harder now than ever before and with uh, less checks and balances than ever before. So he was right, excepting he, he, the Labour Party that was the beneficiary of that book's thesis learnt nothing between those uh, years 84 and 1990. Things got severely reined back in in 1996 and the legislative program proves that. So, uh, but he did put forward the idea for a royal commission, correct? Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, but he, he uh, what about when he became prime minister for for the? I believe it was eleven months. Or yeah, yes, yes. Uh, did uh, and you were in parliament at that yes, time. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, did he move forward on uh, any electoral reforms while he was prime minister? Uh, well, he, he, the royal commission was one, and uh, that's a great start. But that's where it stayed. We had a referendum because the National Party, for the first time in its history, in 1990 had a, in its manifesto electoral reform as a separate subject, a separate manifesto promise. And they were forced to do that by those inside uh, the National Party who were campaigners for change. Uh, you were in the National Party? Very small group of us it was at the time. I could, I could tell you just about who they all were inside the National Party caucus. Very, very small group. Do you think a lot of that was to take advantage of Labor's, well, David Long, uh, Longy's campaign promise during the 1987 leaders' debate and how he yes. didn't follow through on that? Mm. Well, exactly. Uh, but the National Party leadership had no intention of following through on it either. But they, but they, they well, were forced to. Well, they were forced to. And we ended up with not one referendum, two. There could have been a runoff, the four versus first past the post. I still think MMP would have won, but they had two referenda. Well, uh, that's about it. Is there anything else that you think that I uh, may be going down the wrong path on? Anything you want to clarify or anything you want to add? Or any of the changes that you'd make to MMP? Hey? Or any changes that you'd make to MMP? Uh, well, as I say, I'd, I'd feel give it a couple more elections before I'd rush to judgment on that. But um, when you look at the positive side, uh, you know, there is an environmental group in the world, but whether you agree with them or not, and New Zealand is a country where most politicians are very environmentally sensitive, uh, there should be a voice in Parliament. Uh, that voice should be in the major parties and every party as well. Um, there is a, a group of people out there who have uh, strong agrarian interests. Where their voice is now, I don't know. Uh, there is uh, a group out there who are Maori and Polynesian there is some structure for them to be represented in Parliament, but the, the numbers are in Parliament better 
um, um, mirror what New Zealand's society is like. That is a stabilizing element in that democracy. You shut people out, what option do you give them? Well, violent protests in the streets and uh, a disbelief, disengagement, a sense of enemy with the law is what happens in many societies, and luckily we're not like that. Do you think that that's happening a little bit in the United States right now? Well, the United States has got some marvelous features about it, but when you see that maybe only 28% of the eligible adults vote for the president, you've got to ask yourself, what happened to so disengage so many people from the electoral process? And it should be, and it's got to be answered. You just can't ignore that. Uh, when so many people, over 70%, apparently are not involved. Now, um, what well, we'd regard that as a, an alarming feature. And I'm not being critical. There's obviously an, an answers to that, or reasons for that. But I would suggest that anyone who truly wanted to call themselves a believer in democracy, a true Democrat, not party, I mean, a true dem Democrat, whether Republican or uh, uh, Democrat, would think that that problem needed to be addressed. All right. Uh, I, think, uh, I think that's it. Are we yeah, if I could ask you while the tape's still rolling, are we, um, how do you feel about us putting a copy of this in the film archives unedited? Fine by me, I'll stand by everything I say. Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, um, what, what, about, what about online so that people who don't have access to the film? I don't mind, I don't mind. Okay. That's unedited that we're talking about. Yeah, um, I don't mind, I'm not going to back up anything I've said here. Cool. Well, we will have to edit it just to get it from a uh, high definition format to MP4, upload it, that gets technically excited. As long as you run the same questions before the same answer, mm -hmm. right? Don't switch it around, that's all. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so, uh, when did you stop beating your wife? I'm, uh, that's the tradition. I, I, I don't know. I, no, I'm, I'm not actually asking that. Yes. I'm just, you know, that's the traditional. Uh, the traditional you know what the answer to that question is? is? When she tells me to sue you for defamation. <laughs> <laughs> is that it? All right. No, I. Uh, so. I don't know. I, I, I make jokes and then I instantly regret them. So thank you very much for. Nah, you're welcome. Yeah, you're thanks welcome. for that. Uh, we'll just uh, quickly pack up and I hope we haven't delayed you for your meeting. Well, no, I've got a bit of flexibility. I'll see you later. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you. What's you your first again? name again? Helen. Helen? Yeah. Helen? Breeze. Like the wind, but slower. Helen Breeze. I'll yeah. tell Brittany and Jill. Yeah, she does. Yeah. I don't remember that name. I haven't met, met a person called Breeze in my life. <laughs> This might actually, I don't need a release. I know that he stands by his word. Yeah. But, um, Distribution companies that we're trying to get in yeah. the States. Well, we could, well, we, well, we, we, wouldn't, we might be able to use as we're basically because they won't take anything that we don't have sign off for every single person. But what we, what we can do is we can still put this in the New Zealand mm -hmm. Film Archives and put it online so that maybe you can make it, you know, um, yeah. you know, put it in the New Zealand Film Archives for research purposes. Uh, basically, using a cultural resource. Uh, so do it's you want to leave it with me, and I'll see what I can do. Boyko at gmail dot com. Yes. Yeah, I've got it. All right. Okay. Oh. Um, and you just want me to scan that if he signs it, scan it. Scan it, then it'll be fine. Yeah, that that would work. And if he if he decides not to scan it, that's absolutely fine. Uh, he may choose not to. I uh, after he explained everything to me, I don't think that he would uh, eventually go for it. Maybe the location release, but the talent release, because uh, he, he made a good point. He doesn't want to be involved in uh, any sort of legal contracts mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And 
I, I mean, like, it's not. It, it's a minor disappointment, but I still think it's going to be uh, useful for you know New Zealand's history. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll see. What we might do is we might put together a rough cut and then ask him to sign release for specifically for the cut in the Brown. That's the uh, founding president of New Zealand First, Doug Willerton. Yeah. Uh, you know who that is? That's hmm. that's Brian Donnelly, who is. Uh, was a former minister, education minister, um, and obviously New Zealand first um, MP. And that's Ron Mark, who used to be uh, involved in the Middle East as security and things like that there, right. uh, and also has been a candidate and MP since 1996, hmm. as they all have been. Uh, um, yeah. Barbara joined us in uh, 2002, uh, so did Peter Farani. Um, that's the same, and these are the 202 people. Yeah. Craig McNair, um, these ones here, you know, oh, the present president of the party, um, uh, who's uh, Dale Jones, is there, Edwin Perry, uh, Bill Gudgeon, they're still involved with the party, but not as MPs now. Right. Um, Catchpole, Barino, and that's my brother, who was also a member of New Zealand First, who is yeah, now yeah. involved as uh, in the pro vice chancellor, I think they call them at, uh, at Auckland University. Right, right, right. Oh, cool. Where yeah. is it here? Yeah. 